Well, I figured there'd be a few of us turkeys here tonight. <laughs> Those who aren't, uh, you know, home preparing a crazy meal for tomorrow. Man, ooh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, let's open our Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 19, shall we? Second Chronicles chapter 19. Now, you recall that um, at the death of Solomon in 930 B.C., Israel was divided into two kingdoms. You had the ten northern tribes called Israel and the two southern tribes called Judah. And beginning in 2 Chronicles chapter 10 through chapter 36 verse 21, we'll be dealing primarily with the 20 kings of the southern kingdom called Judah. Uh, we've looked at three so far. We've looked at Rehoboam, Abijah, and Asa. Now, last time we were together in chapter 17 and 18, we began to look at the fourth king of Judah. His name was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Uh, his name means Jehovah has judged. As we mentioned, he was the king of Judah for 25 years from 872 to 848 BC. Uh, he was a good king. However, he was not perfect. He had his faults. He had his flaws. In fact, we saw that um, he allowed his son, uh, Jeroboam, to, or not Jeroboam, uh, Jehoram, to marry Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. Now, Ahab was, is the eighth king in the north in Israel, very wicked and evil king. And as a result of that alliance, he went to battle with King Ahab against the Syrians. And we saw that while Jehoshaphat was a good king, he wasn't the brightest bulb of the bunch uh, because Ahab, going into war with the Syrians, told Jehoshaphat, hey, Joel, um, when we go to battle, why don't you put on your kingly robes and I'll put on a suit of armor and pretend to be a soldier when we go into battle? And Jehoshaphat said, okay. And they went into battle and of course uh, they converged on King Jehoshaphat and they said, we've got the king, you know. And Jehoshaphat said, well, yeah, but I'm the king of Judah. I'm not Ahab, the king of the north. And they said, oh, so they let him go. And you know, they randomly shot an arrow into the air and it struck Ahab in the chink in his armor and he subsequently died. Now, as we come to chapters 19 and 20, we come to, uh, to look at the life of Jehoshaphat as he ends his life. Now, these last two chapters, chapters 19 and 20, conclude the life of Jehoshaphat. And there are several things we want to look at and learn about in these last two chapters dealing with his life. Number one, the first thing we want to look at involves the consequences for Jehoshaphat. The consequences for Jehoshaphat. That's in verses 1 through 3. Take a look. In verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 19, it says, Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, uh, um, excuse me, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Now, you'll recall we just mentioned that Jehoshaphat aligned himself with King Ahab to go to war against the Syrians. It's something he should not have done because here the prophet says he loves those who hate the Lord and he helps the wicked. Now, for that sin for that transgression, Jehoshaphat will experience consequences. In fact, according to the end of verse 2, he'll experience the wrath of the Lord. And I think the point for us is pretty simple. We see it over and over and over in Scripture that there are always consequences to our actions. There's always a price to pay for sin. In fact, Paul said in Romans 2.6 that God will render to each man according to his deeds. 
payday one day. Uh, Galatians 6, 7 says we're going to reap what we sow. And if we think, <laughs> if we think that somehow God doesn't see what we're up to or somehow he forgot about what we have done, well, we're only fooling ourselves. Hebrews 4.13 says, There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. Look, we're not hiding anything from God. If we think we can secretly sin and somehow pull it off and there's not going to be any consequences, well, we're fooling ourselves. In fact, in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, the Bible says, Be sure your sin will find you out. So here we see the, the roost, the, the chickens coming home to roost, so to speak. Nevertheless, verse 3, good things are found in you. What is the good thing found in him? Well, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Look, we all fall short. We all mess up. Jehoshaphat certainly did. And he suffered the wrath of God, the consequences. And yet, here we see a beautiful principle that when our heart is bent towards seeking the Lord, there's a good thing found in us. Look, none of us are perfect. We all fall short. We all sin. There is none righteous. No, not one. That's not the issue. The issue is what are we going to do after we sin? When we fall short, when we mess up, what are we going to do? Well, hopefully we're going to prepare our heart to seek the Lord because that's the good thing that can be found in us, if you will. The fact that we're willing to confess, that we're willing to repent and get right with God and seek the Lord, prepare our heart to seek Him. Beautiful. Well, uh, let's come to the second thing we want to look at. We've looked at the consequences for Jehoshaphat. The second section, we see the judges from Jehoshaphat in verses 4 through 11. The judges from Jehoshaphat. Here, Jehoshaphat is going to bring the judges back into the land. Take a look. In 2 Chronicles 19.4, it says, So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people of Beersheba down in the south to the mountains of Ephraim there in the north and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. Now stop right there for just a moment. As we're going to see, he brings back the Levites. He brings back uh, the judges, if you will, those who are in authority to watch over and judge and instruct the people. But I think it's interesting to note here in verse 4 how it ties to verse 3. Because in verse 3, Jehoshaphat's heart was prepared to seek the Lord. And as soon as his heart was prepared to seek the Lord, immediately in verse 4, he was now seeking others for the Lord, for the ministry of the Lord. And boy, what a beautiful picture that paints. Because when our hearts are truly prepared for seeking the Lord, it should result in us seeking other people to come to the Lord. We might say having a heart for the lost, having a heart for those who are lost, which, by the way, is the heart of Jesus. That's Jesus' heart. In fact, the key verse in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Beautiful. Well, then, according to verse 5, he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Now, therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it, and Take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality, nor taking of bribes. Boy, what a good word for the judges of Judah. Which, by the way, this is a good word for the judges today as well. Uh, to, to, to be careful, to take heed, to watch out, because what you're doing, you're doing for the Lord, not for Man, boy, wouldn't it be great if all of our judges had the fear of God rather than the fear of man? That they were operating based on the word of God and the fear of God, that all of our judges would put God first. 
Now, it's easy for us to amen that, is it not? I mean, we think of those in authority, those judges, those who are over others. Man, if they just had the fear of God, if they would just do unto the Lord and not unto man, and we, you know, really can get behind that ideology. But it's interesting, what is true for them is equally true for us. <laughs> Hello? Now, I didn't get a big amen on that one, by the way. <laughs> Hopefully, we too have that fear of God, that reverential awe of God, so much so that we recognize that, well, we shouldn't act with iniquity or partiality or with bribes. In other words, putting someone above somebody else because of what they have or what we can get from them. No, we need to be looking at everything in light of the fear of the Lord, putting God first. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever we do, do heartily as unto the Lord, not unto man. Moreover, verse 8, this section continues. Moreover, in Jerusalem, for the judgment of the Lord and for the controversies, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites and priests and some of the chief fathers of Israel when they had returned to Jerusalem. And he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a loyal heart. Whatever case comes to you from your brethren who dwell in their cities, whether of bloodshed or offenses against law or commandment, against statute or ordinance, you shall warn them lest they trespass against the Lord and wrath come upon them. And your brethren do this, and you will not be guilty. And take notice. Amariah, the chief priest, is over you all in all the matters of the Lord. And Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters, also the Levites will be officials before you. Behave courageously, and the Lord will be, uh, and, and the Lord will be with the good. So here, the appointment of the judges and the different organizational aspects of each judgeship, if you will, over the variety of, uh, of people, over the kingdom, and, and over spiritual matter, matters and physical matters. The, the interpretation is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. But what's important to note are two things. First of all, in verse 9, there were three qualifications for those who judge the affairs of others. They had to fear the Lord, they had to be faithful to the Lord, and they had to have a loyal heart for the Lord. The point is, all of their judgments involved and revolved around the Lord. So when that would be the case, there would be no iniquity, there'd be no partiality, there would be no bribery. And boy, what a beautiful principle that sets for us. If we would live our lives in the fear of the Lord, being faithful to the Lord and having a, a, a loyal heart for the Lord, we too would be able to minister one to another without partiality, uh, without thinking that someone is a little better than someone else because of what I can get or what's in it for me, if you will. But I think the second important thing to note is in verse 10 that all of their trespasses or their sins are against the Lord. All of these various court cases that come before the judges, they need to recognize that the sin, the iniquity, is before the Lord, not before man. And this is an important principle because, yes, our sin, listen, our sin affects the lives of others. There's no doubt about that. When we sin, our sin affects other people. That's why in Matthew 18, 15, Jesus said, if a brother sins against you, go to him. So clearly, if somebody's sin affects our lives, we're to go to them. But ultimately, they don't sin against us. They sin against God because of the definition of sin according to the Bible. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says that sin is a transgression of the law. That's the biblical definition of sin. Sin is a transgression of the law. And of course, God wrote the law. So all sin is against God. David knew that in Psalm 51, 4. Joseph knew that in Genesis 39, 9. You say, okay, Clark, I get it. But why is that so important that we understand that all sin is against God? 
Well, because when somebody's sin affects our lives, we have a tendency to think that what they've done, they've done to us. And we want to get even. We want to smack them upside their pointy little head. Tit for tat. I want my pound of flesh. Does anybody understand what we're talking about? But when we understand that while their sin may affect my life, ultimately their sin is against God, now all of a sudden we have a whole different attitude toward them. Because what they did, they did against my Lord. They sinned against my Jesus, and that breaks my heart. That causes me to to be broken inside, and it causes me to pray for them and, and, and to be willing to forgive and forget. And this is an important principle to be sure. Well, let's come to the third thing we want to look at. <clears throat> the third thing involves the seeking by Jehoshaphat. The seeking by Jehoshaphat. Now, in chapter 20 of Second Chronicles, we see this in verses 1 through 4. I like it. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, it says it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon, remember the descendants of Lot from his two daughters, and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria. And they are in Hazazon, Tamar, which is in Gedi, or the spring of the wild goat. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together and asked help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So the Syrians who were up in the north, no doubt traveled down the king's highway south to the region of uh, Ammon and then Moab on the eastern side of the Dead Sea all the way to the southern end of the Dead Sea uh, where, the, where the Moabites were. They no doubt came up under the Dead Sea to the west side as they traveled north and they came to En Gedi or the spring of the wild goat. So the Syrians, the Moabs, the Ammonites were preparing for battle against Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom of Judah. But in verses 1 through 4, we see that Jehoshaphat and Judah was also preparing for battle against their enemies. How? Well, twice we're told they were seeking the Lord. Twice they were seeking the Lord. They were turning to the Lord for help in the battle that was getting ready to happen. And boy, what a beautiful principle that sets for us. Because when the battles in our lives come, and they will, we all have a choice to make. We can either seek others for help, or we can seek the Lord for help. Now, this, of course, goes without saying. This is a very uh, obvious choice that all of us have to make. Either we're going to turn to others, or we're going to turn to the Lord. We're going to seek help from others, or we're going to seek help from the Lord. But what I find amazing is how quickly... <laughs> <laughs> we turn to seek help from others rather than the Lord. Why is that? Why are we so quick to pick up the phone, to talk to somebody, to, to call somebody, to email somebody, rather than to seek the Lord? I just find it very interesting. And I really don't have an answer as to why, other than... We lack faith. Other than we lack faith in God's ability to fight this battle, to help us in the midst of the battles. I don't know, maybe we're just more happy to have somebody with flesh on. <laughs> Thinking that somehow that's going to help us a lot more than God can. I don't know. But I know in my life it's, uh, it's something I constantly need to be aware of. Something I always need to remember. Because when the battles come, man, my first instinct is to, to grab Sally or to talk to somebody or to let's get together and figure this out and let's have a meeting or, you know, it's just, it's crazy. 
rather than saying, okay, Lord, I want to seek you. And here twice we see that. It's beautiful. Well, the fourth thing involves the prayer from Jehoshaphat. Not only the seeking by Jehoshaphat, but the prayer from Jehoshaphat. That's in verses 5 through 13. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5, it says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwelt in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying... If disaster comes upon us, such as a sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now hear are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade uh, when they came out of the land of Egypt back in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Uh, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit it. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Wow. What a beautiful picture these first 13 verses of Second Chronicles chapter 2 puts together for us. Here is this vast enemy preparing to attack Jehoshaphat and Judah. And they began to seek the Lord. They were seeking the Lord through fasting and prayer. It's a simple formula. It's a biblical formula. It's something we see throughout Scripture. Man, whenever the enemy is ready to attack, the first thing we should do is seek the Lord through fasting and prayer. And their prayer is a great prayer for us to model. Because here is the king of Judah coming before God saying, Lord, we have no power. Lord, we don't know what to do. So our eyes are on you. <laughs> we're going to turn to you. We, we're going to rely upon you. We're going to trust in you to fight this battle for us. And you know, I believe that's where God wants each and every one of us to be. A place of absolute humility and abs absolute dependence upon Him. Relying on His strength, on His power, on His ability to conquer the enemy. And simply relinquishing our plan to His plan. Saying, God, I got nothing. I, I, <laughs> I have no power. I, I have no plan. I have no purpose to fight this enemy. I need your help. I need your sufficiency. And here's the good news, family. When we truly humble ourselves, James chapter 4, verse 10 tells us, God will lift us up. If we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, He will lift us up. He will be the one to empower us and, and strengthen us and give us the sufficiency we need for the battle that we're ready to go into. In fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, that we are not sufficient in and of ourselves to think of anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is in Christ, who makes us sufficient. And boy, what a beautiful picture these first 13 verses paint. Well, let's come to a fifth thing we want to look at. And that involves the answer for Jehoshaphat. We looked at the prayer from Jehoshaphat. Now let's take a look at the answer for Jehoshaphat. In verses 14 through 17, God answers his prayer. Take a look. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 14, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord 
came upon Zahazael, the son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the congregation, saying, <clears throat> And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Boy, what a beautiful answer to prayer. God, we need help. We got nothing. We are nothing. We're trusting in you. And God's answer was, I got this. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For this battle doesn't belong to you. The battle is God's. You know, that's the same thing young David told Goliath. There in the Valley of Elah in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47, as this nine-foot-tall, nine-inch giant from Gath came out full of armor with a giant spear the size of a weaver's beam, and here is this young shepherd boy with a sling and five smooth stones. <laughs> and little Davy... He says, the battle belongs to the Lord. And boy, what a glorious truth that is. You know, all the battles in our lives, they belong to God. Because the truth of the matter is, we are all in a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, we're all in a spiritual battle, but here's the good news. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.4 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of these strongholds. And what a wonderful truth that is. Is it no wonder we read in verse 17, God told them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, those are the exact same words that God told Moses back in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Remember when uh, Moses and the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt? God was leading them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God led them right out of Egypt, right to the bank of the Red Sea with two mountain ranges, one to the north, one to the south, Phi-Hahiroth and Baal-Zaphon. And here they were hemmed in on all three sides. Militarily speaking, a very bad maneuver. And here comes the Egyptian army to fill in the only way out. And the children of Israel began to freak out. Mo, what in the world have you done? Brought us out in the wilderness to die? And Moses turns to the children of Israel. Exodus 14, 13 says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God parted the Red Sea and they crossed on dry land. You all know the story. But what is true for them is true for us. It was true for Moses. It was true for David. It's true for Jehoshaphat, and it's true for us. Man, we just need to allow God to fight the battle for us. Don't, we don't need to be afraid or dismayed. We don't have to freak out and worry and, and pull our hair out and, and go absolutely bonkers because of the circumstances and situations that we're going through in life. Look, God's on the throne. He's going to take care of it. He's in charge, and he knows what he's doing, and he knows when he needs to do it. And boy, what great rest, what great peace that brings. Well, let's come to a sixth matter. The sixth thing involves the faith of Jehoshaphat. The faith of Jehoshaphat. In verses 18 
through 23, we see the great faith of the king of Judah. Take a look. In verse 18 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it says, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, or those from Syria, to utterly kill them and destroy them. In other words, they turned on themselves. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants, of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Wow. What an amazing picture dealing with the faith of Jehoshaphat. Because here we see their faith in the fact that they were singing praises to God. They were worshiping God before the battle even began, before victory had ever occurred. They were already praising the Lord, thanking the Lord, worshiping the Lord before the victory ever came. Wow, that's faith. They were living their lives as though God's promise of victory had already happened. Isn't that interesting? Typically, that's what I do after the victory comes. When the victory comes, I say, oh, praise the Lord. Man, let's worship the Lord. Man, we just got the victory. Hey, where's the faith in that? God wants us to live by faith. And here we see that they were living their lives as though God's promises had already transpired, as though the victory was already won. God help me. God help all of us to live by faith. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, that all of God's promises in Christ are yes and amen. Do we truly believe that all of God's promises are yes and amen? (laughs) Okay, three of you, good, okay. The rest can go home and finish making turkey for tomorrow, I guess. Because if we truly believe that all of God's promises are yes and amen, we're not gonna fear, we're not gonna be dismayed. In fact, just the opposite's gonna be true. We are going to be praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord, dancing and singing before the Lord before the victory ever happens. Wow. This is pretty heavy. This is pretty convicting, actually. Because, you know, for six years, we've been fighting the county trying to change the law that makes it legal for churches to be built. Because right now it's illegal. And for six years, we've been fighting it, which has been a a solid, worthy battle, a, a battle that's worthy for us to stand up and to let our voices be heard on. There's no doubt about that. But sometimes I don't live my life as though the victory has already occurred. Sometimes I get a little curious as to how the outcome is going to come about. And sometimes I doubt that Well, God, is this really what you want to do? 
Hey, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes that's how we feel in situations in our lives. But ultimately, I know God's on the throne. And I have absolute faith he's going to be victorious, whatever the outcome is. And, and I think that's part of our problem is we think victory is based on the outcome of the situation. When oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's just about the, the journey from point A to point B. It's not really about getting to point B or, the, or what happens at point B. You, usually it's just about the journey getting to it. Are we walking? And maybe that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we are to walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. Well, back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Let's come to the seventh thing we want to look at. And that involves the rest for Jehoshaphat. The rest for Jehoshaphat. Take a look at verses 24 through 30. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 24, it says, So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were the dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for they blessed the Lord. For there they blessed the Lord. Uh, therefore, the name of that place was called the valley of Barakah. Until this day, uh, Barakah, blessings. Uh, Baruch is blessed. Barakah, the blessings, like Bar Baruch, Hashem, you know, bless the name. Then, verse 27, they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat from in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies so that they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. Man, the victory came from the Lord and the rest came from the Lord. And I think as we put this whole picture together, we see the humility of Jehoshaphat as he humbled himself, totally relying on God, saying, God, I can't fight this battle. I, I don't know what to do. I need you. God stepped in and said, right on. I'll take care of it. You simply stand still and see my salvation. And by faith, he did. By faith, he worshiped the Lord and praised the Lord before the battle even uh, came about. And as a result of all of this, according to the end of verse 30, God gave him rest all around. And I think as we look at these lessons for our lives, it points to and speaks of the quietness and the rest and the peace that you and I can have in our lives, even in the midst of battles, even in the midst of the enemy wanting to attack us. And we're talking about quietness and peace and rest from the inner man, we might say, uh, in our heart, in our spirit. Because we know externally there's always going to be turmoil, there's always going to be battles, there's always going to be trials. But internally, we have that peace, we have that rest, we have that quietness of spirit and soul in light of conflict, in light of trial and turmoil. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. It's that peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. And it's that rest and tranquility that comes through a relationship with him. Well, number eight and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. Let's take a look at the death of Jehoshaphat. The death of Jehoshaphat. That's in verse 31 through verse 1 of chapter 21. Take a look. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 31, it says, So Jehoshaphat was king over Judah, 
He was 35 years old when he became king. He reigned 25 years in Jerusalem, as we've mentioned, from uh, 872 to 848 B.C. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shili. And he walked in the way of his father Asa and did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last indeed, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanai, which is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 16. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, aligned himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who was the son of Ahab, who acted very wickedly. And he aligned himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made ships in Ezion Geber, presumably in the area of the Gulf of Aqaba in Elat. But Eleazar, the son of Dodava of Merishah prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have aligned yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked, so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Now here, once again, we see Jehoshaphat, even though he was a good king, like back in chapter 18, he had another lapse of faith. He wasn't perfect. And what I find interesting about his lapse of faith is that he had the same lapse of faith twice. He aligned himself with the same group twice. And this really blesses me, not that he did that, but that it's recorded for us. Because here we see Jehoshaphat made the same mistake two times. Now that blesses me. Because I've made the same mistake twice before, too. Okay, maybe more than twice. But it just goes to show that these guys in the Bible, they're, they're real, they're human. And they make the same mistakes like we do over and over and over again. And yet we see God use them in a mighty way. Man, there's hope for all of us. Well, according to verse 1 of chapter 21... It says, and Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David there in Jerusalem. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. So Jehoshaphat, the fourth king of Judah, dies. His son Jehoram becomes king and Lord willing, next time we're together, we'll continue to look at the story of Jehoram, the fifth king of of Judah. Lord, we do thank you. Lord, for uh, your word, for these few short minutes to be able to come and gather together. And Lord, just to take a look at these men and events that happened such a long time ago, and yet they're so incredibly applicable for each and every one of us today. Lord, your, your word is so incredible. It's so rich, so relevant. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, these life lessons would be learned by all of us as we live our lives to bring glory to you. So Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? <clears throat> you know, if you would like to hang out after service for about 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to break down the sanctuary. We're going to take all the Bibles from out from under the chairs and put them in the carts and stack up the chairs and put them against the walls and break out all the tables and get ready for Thanksgiving tomorrow. So if you'd like to help set that up, you are more than welcome to do that. I'm really sick, so I'm going to go home and go to bed. Uh, I will see you guys Sunday. God bless you. <laughs> I love you all. God bless. You going to close us with a song, yes. Terry? All right. Thanks, brother.